The Spanish Civil War is an interesting conflict because in many ways it's the first real war fought in Western Europe between the First World War and the Second World War. And today I'd like to look at tanks during the Spanish Civil War. Also because this video is kindly being sponsored by World of Tanks and because it's a really interesting topic to delve into. Because of course you have the First World War is the first time that tanks are used in combat, these land ship type vehicles, as well as in the Second World War. But then where does the Spanish Civil War fit in in this broader picture? because of course it does sit right between these two conflicts and so the tank doctrine and the tanks that are being used are a very interesting mix of both and would have an important effect on the later second world war many people even say that hitler tested the blitzkrieg in spain that this was used but if this statement is true or not is something else that I'd like to look into about how the tanks were used during the Spanish Civil War. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to my good friend Rob who really helped me out with the research for this video and created some of the absolutely stunning tank designs that are going to be featured later on. You'll definitely be seeing more of him, especially in my vlogs from Romania over the summer, so stay tuned and a big mulțumesc frumos to my Romanian friend there. Alright, so the Spanish Civil War, for those of you who don't know, I've made lots of videos about. It was a conflict in Spain in the 1930s between the Second Spanish Republic and a nationalist rebellion. I'll put cards and links up if you want to find out more. So let's take a look at how were tanks used before the Spanish Civil War, so in the First World War and later. So t let's take a look at the pre-1936 tank doctrine. So land ships were the name of the game to begin with. The first tanks essentially evolved from land ships, which as the name suggests and as the etymology of tank is as well, were these great big lumbering iron structures that went across the battlefields of the First World War. Now, essentially the aim of the game for these, and as time progressed onwards, was to act as infantry support. So you had the tanks, they would be there to support the infantry, and they would go through and, and drive through barriers and barricades and machine gun posts. That was essentially the idea of the tank, was to get across no man's land and break through the enemy lines, rather than having a massed armoured column or using tanks altogether, as would be done later on. So let's take a look at the Anglo-French tank doctrine of the time. So tanks were designed to be the best infantry support, so the name of the game was to try and create a vehicle that would be the best at supporting the infantry in obtaining their objectives. And they also had howitzer guns and anti-tank weapons, but they had wide tracks and the main, again, the idea was to be there to support the infantry and to break through hard points in an enemy's defensive line. The Germans, on the other hand, had quite a different tank doctrine, and this was for several reasons. They'd lost the war, which meant that they were much more eager to actually innovate and to change things with the tanks because, well, it hadn't worked for them in the First World War. Also, because of the Treaty of Versailles, it meant that the German government wasn't actually able to invest in tanks until much later on, and so they didn't have the same doctrinal culture as the British and the French in the interwar period, so they were able to innovate because they hadn't had that build-up to seeing tanks in the same way as the British and the French did, for example. Now that we've taken a look at the doctrines, let's take a look at how the tanks actually got to Spain, where the tanks that were being used in Spain came from. So, the Spanish Civil War wasn't meant to be a war, which sounds like a silly thing to say, but essentially it was meant to be a nationalist takeover. The reason that it failed and became a civil war is because several militias and army units in several cities stopped the nationalists from taking over, and then you got the civil war. So the first tanks essentially came from the military depots of the Spanish army. Now, these tanks had arrived in Spain during the Rif War, which they fought against several North African factions together with the French. So the tank that they got there was the Renault FT, which was a French tank from the First World War that they used, um, as well as the Schneider CA-1. This was essentially a, a troop carrier, a glorified armoured troop carrier. And these were, of course, very old. They had been used in the First World War. They weren't particularly bad tanks, but by 1936, they were very outdated. And they had, of course, arrived in Spain in 1919. Quite a few of them had seen active service as well. So let's now take a look at specifically where the Republicans got them from, because with these tanks, it was the case that whether if the nationalists took over the city, they would get the tank supply. If the Republicans took over the city, they would get the supply of tanks that were there, which is fairly logical. But there is a breakdown to be made between where the Republicans got most of their tanks and where the Nationalists got most of their tanks. So the Republicans were supplied by two nations, the USSR and the uh, Polish state. Now from the Poles, they actually got more of the Renault FTs. These they had been given by the French, uh, I believe, in trying to stop the Soviet invasion in 1920, in the 1920s. Um, 
and these of course were again these were older tanks but they 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 were of some use but they were already very outdated now they also created some of their own tanks called the Trubia and the Trubia was very much based on the Renault FT but they only actually made about 20 of these and the nationalists also did try to make some of their own tank designs so native Spanish designs so to speak but it was mostly the Republicans because the Republicans at least at the start of the war were the ones who had most of the factories under their control which you of course needed to actually produce and make the tanks. The nationalists on the other hand received tanks from both Nazi Germany and from Benito Mussolini's Italy and they sent their own national designs which I'll get onto in a second. So how did they use tanks then? Well to go back to the Republicans, they received most of the pre-war tank stocks because they were able to capture most of the military depots during the coup. But whether this was a blessing or a curse, uh, not entirely sure, because most of these tanks were French hulks. They were, you know, most of them were from before 1920, and they were in pretty terrible condition. They did actually use quite a few of the Schneiders uh, during the uh, urban fighting that went on in 1936. But by the end of 1936, all of the land ships were knocked out. But I'll get on to some of the stories about that at the end of the video. Now the Renault FT that they used were a bit more effective, they were useful enough in uh, city fighting, you could essentially put one in a street and that would block off a street from the enemy because it is a big metal thing with a big gun on it, so in that sense it was useful, but there were no replacement parts, so after several months of fighting most of them would be knocked out of service anyway or would be lacking several key important features. And tactically as well, this was not going to be very significant. As a sort of static fortress that could move around very slowly from time to time, it was all right. But they were 20 plus years old and, you know, they weren't going to be outmaneuvering the enemy at any point. So in, by late 1936, the game changes, though, because by this point, the Soviet Union starts throwing its support behind the Republicans. And that's when they send the T-26, which really changes the tank game in the Spanish Civil War. Now, this was actually the most widely used tank of the Spanish Civil War. The Soviets gave 281 T-26s to the Republican government. And while the nationalists captured quite a few of these, which I'll get onto later on, most of the time this was being used by the Republicans. And this is one of the most effective tanks that was around uh, sort of point blank that was around throughout all of the 1930s as well as in the Spanish Civil War. Now by late 1937 the Soviets actually sent another design which was um, slightly different in character, a BT-5 and this was perhaps the most effective tank of the Spanish Civil War although they only gave 50 of these so quite a few less than the T-26. Now, it was a very fast tank. It was a cavalry tank, so it was good at scouting and potentially outmaneuvering the enemy. It could reach speeds of up to 65 miles an hour, which was an awful lot for a tank back then. But that was on good roads and not necessarily in Spain. A lot of the fighting in Spain was done in very mountainous, hilly terrain that's not ideal for tanks, which is one of the main reasons why we now think that this idea that Hitler tested the Blitzkrieg in Spain is not entirely true because the terrain is very difficult, it's very rugged. Now the Soviets initially planned to crew all 50 of the tanks themselves but they didn't get enough men sent over. Stalin was also doing all sorts of things with purges so he had lots of really innovative, creative um, and effective gen generals and commanders who were working on tank doctrine and tanks and he had most of them got rid of out of the army which you know really could have helped the republic out if they'd have sent those so eventually the crews became hybrids of soviets and spaniards which created all sorts of interesting things because the soviets couldn't speak spanish and for the beginning of the time that they were sending the bt-5s over they didn't have any interpreters either so it was an interesting situation also, the Republicans were very short on spare parts, um, and that was something that would be a, a huge problem for the Republicans. Their tanks were generally better, but they didn't get the spare parts in, and they needed Soviet engineers to keep the tanks in shape. The, the Soviets often complained that the Spanish drivers would fry the clutch on the T-26, and then, of course, they'd have to wait for spare parts to arrive from Russia, which would take months. And so it, it was actually a lot of hassle for the Soviet and the Spanish crews. There, there were problems with the interpreters. And this would be one of the issues that plagued the Republican tankers for the entirety of the war. So what about the Nationalists then? Well, as I said, they were the rebels in the conflict and they received all of their tanks from either the Italians or from the Germans or from captured Republican tanks, which I've just covered. 
So the main tank that they used was the CV-33. This was an Italian tankette design, and these were supplied from Mussolini's Italy, and they were operated completely by Italian crews from the Corpo Truppe Volontare, which is the volunteer corps that was sent by Mussolini to Spain to aid the nationalists. It was the second most exported tank to Spain after the T-26, with 155 of them being given to the nationalists during the war. Now, it had a dual machine gun of 800 millimeters, which proved to be really effective against infantry infantry, but as soon as it came up against armor, it was pretty useless. Now, it could be quite a good infantry support vehicle, which, as again, is, is really what it was used for. It had 10mm sloping armor, so it could deflect small arms fire, so it was infantry support and against infantry, it was good, but as well, that meant that it was it was lighter, so it could traverse the Spanish countryside quite well without using f too much fuel. But as soon as it came up against armor, it was pretty useless. Now, there was actually another version of the CV-33 that, instead of having a machine gun, had a flamethrower attached. And this was actually slightly smaller and faster, and that meant it could sneak up on enemy positions. So, tactically, quite a good tank. And actually, also, in terms of effectivity, it was also the most effective tank for the nationalists in the early war because it was the only one that could actually destroy an enemy tank. The way it achieved this was to sneak up on the enemy tank and then to completely douse it in flames. And what this would essentially do, it's a bit grim, is to cook the other tankers inside the enemy tank alive. And that's how they would knock out an enemy tank in the early war period. Of course, this is incredibly hard to achieve, but this did occur several times. And actually, there are some quite fond and funny nicknames given to the Caro Veloce, which is what the CV-33 stands for. And these include the Lata de Sardinas in Spanish, which is the Sardine Tin, which is what the Spanish crew members called this tank. Whereas the Italians called it the Topolino, which means mouse in Italian, because uh, it is a bit of a smaller tankette. But I thought that was a nice touch. So anyway, now let's take a look at the PZ-1. And if you're wondering what PZ stands for, it is Panzerkampfwagen, which in German is the fancy and long word for tank. But the PZ-1 was, of course, a German design that was given to the nationalists in Spain. And it's the first time that the Germans, following the First World War, got to test out their tank designs. So the PZ-1 was the second most supplied tanks to the nationalists during the war after the Italians. And it actually had a turret, unlike the CV-33. It was ergonomically practical for the crew. And essentially, as you can see, the basic design is there for how tanks would become used. Later on, of course, the Germans had a big hand in uh, developing tanks going into the 1940s. And so they built upon the design of the PZ-1 to create the later panzers that are quite famous from the Second World War. The armor was 13 millimeters thick and it could sustain small arms fire just like the CV-33 and it had a machine gun that could fire back with that was effective against infantry but it was low caliber so it wasn't going to get through any enemy armor anytime soon. So in this way it was actually inferior to the Soviet T-26 and it couldn't go through the armor and it could quite easily be destroyed by the T-26s and BT-5s that the Spanish Republicans were using. I think it's fair to say that the PZ-1 was the favored design for the nationalists during the war because it was bigger than the CV-33 which meant it was more useful as an infantry support vehicle and the turret gave it better battlefield awareness. Although because it was slightly heavier and because of these other features it did mean it was less economical so more fuel was needed and it could go less far in a day than the CV-33. All right, so now let's take a look at the captured tanks that the nationalists managed to take from the Republicans, because this is actually a very significant number. Given that the number of tanks the Republicans had throughout the war would be, and I'm going to put in a guess here, around 500 from the figures I've seen, they managed to capture about 180 of these tanks, which is, you know, it's shy of half, but it's, it's definitely a third, which is my amazing maths coming out again. So this is a really large number. And so a lot of the Republican tanks, the superior tanks a lot of the time, were being used against them towards the end of the war by the nationalists. Now, in late 1936, the nationalists thought we really do need to get our hands on a tank that can actually destroy an enemy tank because there had been several tank battles by this point, which I'm going to get onto in a second. So they were seeing about attaching a 20mm autocannon to the top of either the CV-33 or the PZ-1. But eventually they chose the PZ-1 as the better candidate for this, and so they created a tank that was called the PZ-1 Breda. 
and I'm going to get into this in just a second. But first of all, I would like to talk about today's video sponsor, which is World of Tanks, because the PZ1 Breda you can actually play as in this game. Now, in case you don't know, World of Tanks is a free to play game that puts you in the gunner, driver and spotter seats of over 600 tanks. And they're all looking at the history and they're trying to create the most accurate tanks and how they would maneuver and where you can pierce the armor and tactically playing with tanks in these very large games. And if you're a new player, you can actually follow the link that's in the description below and sign up. And if you do that and use the code TANKTASTIC, which I'll put on the screen at the end if you're not sure how to spell that, is that you'll get 500 gold and 7 days premium, as well as getting a T-127 tank. Now, the name might not sound very familiar, but that tank is actually a prototype for the T-50, which was the replacement for the light tanks of the T-26 and the BT-5, which I've been talking about in this video. So if you want to actually sort of step into the driver's seat of the things that I'm talking about in this video, then I'd highly recommend taking a look at World of Tanks because then you can literally play along to some of the things that I've been talking about. Of course, most of the tanks are from a slightly later period, from the Second World War, but it's a really fun game. I used to play this game actually rather a lot as well, and I really enjoyed sort of rolling around the map and shooting people up in tanks. It's honestly great fun, so I would actually really recommend that you do this. So do check out World of Tanks, there is a link in the description below, and as you can see, you just need to go and use the invite code TANKTASTIC to get in and get these great bonuses. So give it a go, World of Tanks guys, I'd highly recommend it if you found this video interesting. And thank you to World of Tanks for sponsoring this video. There was a very particular issue to do with the PZ-1 Breda, with this 20mm autocannon strapped to the top of the PZ-1 tank. And this is that to do it, they actually had to cut a huge hole into the front of the Breda so they could actually see outside because obviously there's now this whopping great turret on top of it. And this isn't an issue that you'll get if you play the tank in World of Tanks because there's no little infantry running around. But during the Spanish Civil War, what this meant was that a plucky Republican sniper could quite happily take out the driver and the crew through this great big hole at the front of the PZ-1 Breda. And so a lot of the Spanish nationalist crews simply refused to drive them. And actually the German high command of the Condor Legion expressed serious doubts about the combat capabilities of this new tank. But nonetheless, it was the only one they had to match against the armor of the T-26 and the BT-5. And so the nationalists continued to roll out the uh, PZ-1 Breda into the combat. Are there any examples of actual tank battles during the Spanish Civil War? Well, the first times they were being used was 1936, as I said during the initial coup. And actually, this was the last time that land ships were being used in active combat, so these great big lumbering hulks from the First World War. And the land ships in question, the Schneiders, were actually from 1916, so from 20 years earlier. And these were used in the street fighting in Madrid and in Toledo, both of which during 1936. And actually, there is an example of one of these land ships being used in an attempt to try and take a building. And so the nationalists, to counteract this, actually went and created a big bundle of grenades. They sort of uh, taped it together with something and threw it at the land ship and the land ship exploded into a million pieces. And this was actually the way the nationalists dealt with these big land ships during the initial coup in 1936 in the street fighting was to get these great big bundles of grenades and to sort of blow it up in that way. And this turned out to be so effective that actually the Republican army refused to crew the great big land ships. But they did actually manage to give them off to these really radical communist militias that sprang up all over to fight against the nationalists. And they ended up crewing the land ships, but to little effect. In terms of tank on tank combat, there's an interesting case study that can be made from late 1936, which is the Battle of Sesenia, which occurred just outside of Madrid. It was in the same attack on Madrid when the first Soviet drivers had come in. And actually a Soviet mission that went out around the, the capital encountered quite a few of the Italian tankettes, also with a supporting companies from the Corpo Truppe and Spanish nationalist soldiers there. And this battle actually turned into the favor of the Soviets quite quickly, despite being outnumbered by the nationalists and by the tankettes. And there's a great example of when one of the T-26s was completely surrounded by tankettes and it had run out of ammunition that it simply rammed through them. And that kind of shows the different caliber of tank that was being used by both sides. As well, that was very significant during this battle was that the Soviet doctrine at the time was really quite advanced for the period. 
and they were using tanks as massed armor, whereas the nationalists, the CV-33s, were being used as just infantry support, and the results really speak for themselves. So the nationalists during the battle, they lost just about 11 of the uh, CV-33s and about 600 men, according to Republican statistics, whilst the Nationalists, on the other hand, or sorry, the Republicans, lost three T-26s and just eight men. So this was a resounding success for the Republicans, although it should be said that later on, the same T-26s ran into trouble because the Nationalists found out that if they lit up wine bottles and threw them at the T-26s, they could cause damage to the tanks and to the tank crews inside them, and and they were forced to retreat, which is also kind of a funny story. In 1937, there's another battle during which tanks played a very important role. This was the Battle of Guadalajara, and during this battle, the Corpo Truppe Voluntari tried to advance across very sort of boggy terrain, very rugged terrain that they couldn't get across, and this essentially led to them getting bogged down and shot up by the Republican artillery and by the tanks there. Um, and this was really a, a bad day for the Nationalists, the Republican tanks, again, showing that they were superior to what the Nationalists had to offer. In 1938, however, it would be the Republicans' turn to cross boggy ground just south of Zaragoza during the Battle of the Ebro, or the Fuentes del Ebro, as it's sometimes called in Spanish. This time it was the BT-5s and the T-26s of the Soviets that were attacking strongly reinforced Nationalist positions. It was also one of the first times that they used tanks as troop transport, so they had their uh, Republican troops that were going into battle, a lot of them from the international brigades. They had sat on the, the tops of the tanks, but they moved in too quickly and a lot of the, the soldiers actually fell off. And so the attack was not very well coordinated and it ended up being a real failure for the Republicans, during which they lost a lot of tanks. In fact, so many tanks were lost during the battle that they then handed them off to the reserves because they were no longer really an effective fighting force at that time. Alright everyone, so I hope you've enjoyed this video, it's been quite a long one, again a big thank you to Rob for helping me out with the beautiful tank designs in this video, as well as of course doing the research there. I'm going to make another video about how the tanks of the Spanish Civil War, or about how the lessons that were learned in the Spanish Civil War became important for the Second World War, because there is often quite a lot made about that, and I think it would be an interesting video, as well as some other things about tanks in general during this period, and about the Spanish Civil War, I've got quite a few videos anyway. Anyway, so do feel free to check those out. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of my patrons for helping me out. I really appreciate all your support and to all of you guys for just watching and supporting. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe and check out World of Tanks as well if you would be so inclined. So thank you for watching. I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.